I remember the other week that I shared that I was going to watch less news and start watching more inspirational videos and movies. And that I did. This week, I watched an award-winning Netflix documentary called The Dance, which is centered around the career of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, who won six NBA championships through the 90s. And I didn't just casually watch. I watched all 10 episodes twice this week. <laughs> I couldn't tear myself away. I and mean, I found myself crying like before the first episode was over. I mean, that's how moved I was by it. And I watched it, you know, I, I began to enjoy basketball in, uh, after my mom had her stroke. We, we watched uh, basketball together and she taught me to really like basketball a lot more than I liked it previously. But that, that being said, I'm not the hugest basketball fan, but this movie woke me up because it's not essentially a basketball movie. It's a personal story of triumph. And it was spiritual for me. You know that that feeling that you get when time kind of stops for you and when a movie just reaches out and freezes time for you and makes everything more intense and more real and gives you perspective. Well, this this uh, Netflix series did that for me. But first, a little bit of a background. Michael Jordan is clearly a basketball superstar, right? But he is widely considered the number one basketball player of all time. He is one of those athletes who transcends the sport, becomes bigger than just the sport, and gains international attention in a very, very real way, in a very big way that very few others have, such as Muhammad Ali and Babe Ruth. He had a global impact before social media was a thing, a dozen years before social media was a thing. But he had high pressure on himself. The expectations were very high. His rookie year, when he was 21 years old, Larry Bird had a shoe with Converse, Magic Johnson had a shoe deal with Converse, and Michael Jordan signed a five-year deal worth five times what they were getting with Nike. His his rookie year in the NBA. And some people were saying, who is this guy? He hasn't even done anything yet. And yet the world is watching him, right? Well, he had done some things leading up to that uh, in through college and his first few, few games. People were just crazy about him, but the pressure was on, he had to succeed. But Michael had many setbacks and losses in his life starting at an early age. He was not the best basketball player in his family. He had several brothers and his older brother, Larry, was actually the better basketball player. And that made his drive even more great to become better than his brother. When he got to high school, he didn't have it easy. His sophomore year, he tried out for the team and he got cut. They thought he was nothing special. He came home dejected and crying and his mom looked at him and said, honey, if you want to make the basketball team, just work hard for it over the summer and don't give up. So he practiced all summer and the next year he was solid in the team. Later, when he reached the NBA, his second season in the Bulls, he got injured and he broke. He had a clear break on this bone on the top of his foot. You know, there are many bones in the foot. But this particular injury was one that people said he some people don't recover from this injury because the location on the foot doesn't get much circulation right there on that bone on the top. So people were scared. Is he going to make it back? And I believe that he willed his foot just like Myrtle Fillmore did. He healed his foot. He healed it quicker than anybody thought he would heal it. In fact, he went off and he snuck out and he was playing basketball with his friends. He wasn't even allowed to play for 12 weeks, but he was playing the, like after a few weeks rest and um, he, he bounced back. Much of his career though in the NBA was getting knocked down and coming back. And 
Whenever he lost a game, his father would put his arm around him and say, son, this is just a bump in the road. You'll come back. So later he went on to win six, to lead his team to six championships. All these winning years were under a coach named Phil Jackson, who Michael loved. But at the beginning of their final and sixth winning season, before the season even began, the general manager, uh, who had kind of a contentious relationship with Phil Jackson, said he was going to get rid of Coach Jackson at the end of that season, win or lose, no matter what. People didn't understand it. And Michael Jordan claimed right there that he would not play with any other coach. So that put a chilling effect on the whole season. Every year, Coach Jackson would give the, se the season a theme name. And since he knew that this was probably gonna be his last season, well, it was gonna be his last season, and it might be Michael's last season, he named this season The Last Dance, hence the name of the Netflix special. So what does The Last Dance mean and what did the other players interpret that to mean? You know, this was, this was a team that had been through five championships up to that point, overcoming all odds, and they knew that they were gonna effectively get disbanded. So The Last Dance could have meant Oh, bummer, you know, let's all be sad because this is our last time together. Let's all be depressed. Let's all complain constantly. But what it meant, and this was exposed in the interviews with the players in this special, it meant to them, this was the last dance. So enjoy the moment. Be in the moment. Enjoy what's happening. And what I took away from this movie was very spiritual and it went further than that. For me, it was, first of all, it was a wake up call. You could see that Michael Jordan was very present in everything he did. He played every game as if it were his last. That was his passion. And he gave a wake up call to his team as if saying, this is not a dress rehearsal. This is it. And I was getting that wake up call too, as I was watching that movie, thinking about the parallels to, to my reality. Michael Beckwith teaches that, he says that we are asleep. We are in a dream state and that we need to wake up, wake up from habitual thought forms, wake up from the tyranny of trends or what society thinks we should do, wake up from ego, wake up from societal expectations, wake up from mediocrity. That's what Michael Beckwith teaches. And Esther Hicks would say we need to wake up because we are under the influence of old beliefs. And when we wake up and make the decision to be awake in our co-creating, we become conscious and deliberate in our co-creating, not just participants on a ride to see what happens, right? We're here. We are here in this time, in this crazy chaotic time, not because, oh gosh, we're in this crazy chaotic time in the world. We are here to be participants and actors in it. So what part are we gonna play in it? A little further thought about waking up is discarding the illusion that we have time, time as precious. It's said that Michael Jordan not only played every game as if it were his last, but he, he played every play as if it were equally as important as, as every other play, whether he was practicing or whether it was a real game. There was no casual game. It was all at this level of intensity up here. And more about this preciousness, preciousness of time, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, said, the trouble is you think you have time. And that is such an interesting quote. And I don't think that Siddhartha meant go out and sell your house now because the world's gonna end tomorrow or next week or next year. But I think what he said was that if we have the attitude that time is cheap and not precious, 
we won't live in a way where every moment is honored. This also reminded me of David Steindl Rast. We played a video of his a few weeks ago. And he said that we must live each day as if it were our first day and as if it were our last day. To me, that is a wake up call. Things change when you think about that kind of litmus test. Last week, I was having a conversation with someone and they told me that they were doing a practice that the Swedish do called dostadning, otherwise known as death cleaning. He said, this is something that you can use as a contemplative tool at any time. You don't have to wait. You don't have to do it at a particular time in your life like the Swedes do. The Swedes do this when, when they're getting on the years and they, they, are, they clean up their house so they don't pass any burdens to their prodigy, right? Or their progeny. But my friend says he's doing this as a practice now, not just thinking about physical things, not just thinking about physical clutter, but thinking about emotional clutter, thinking about guilt, thinking about regret, thinking about resentment, thinking about things that are weighing you down, that are burdens that you're passing to your own self every day. So this dostadning or death cleaning is an interesting way to stop time, if you will, and think of time in a, in a very different way. There's another practice that helps us be fully present. And it reminded me of a line in the movie that said, most people live in fear because they project the past onto the future. Michael Jordan's gift was that he was completely present. And I'll say that again. Most people live in fear because they project the past onto the future, right? That's very interesting and very true for many. And coach Phil Jackson brought Zen Buddhist philosophies to the team to make them more present, to make them one with the basketball, to make them one with the hoop such that they knew before it even got to the basket, if it was going to go in, they were one with the ball. And this kind of presence reminds me of a, uh, something that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh teaches. He said that we can be fully present to whatever we're doing when we meditate, no matter what we're doing, we can take a meditation into places where you normally wouldn't expect a meditation. Some call it, might call it Zazen. You can apply it to anything in your life. For instance, for instance, there might be the Zazen of walking where instead of talking on the phone and instead of trying to distract yourself as you're getting your exercise in, you are just one with the walking. You are one with the nature. You are, if you're on an exercise bike, you are one with the exercise bike, one with your body, one with your breathing, one with your heartbeat, and you're not trying to bring other thoughts in. That can be used as a meditation. When I was in my 20s, I experimented with something I called the Zazen of driving. And you know, when you're driving, the first thing you want to do is put an audio book on and you want to put the radio on, you want to distract yourself. You don't want to really pay attention to the stress of driving because sometimes it is stressful or the boredom of driving. But this Zazen of driving, I used to hold onto the steering wheel and I used to say, all right, I'm going to turn off the radio and I'm going to feel every time I steer, every touch of my foot on the brakes, every touch of my foot on the gas, I'm going to steer. I'm not going to fight the other people in traffic. I'm just going to kind of take the middle path and I'm just going to enjoy the driving, enjoy the driving. I'm one with the car. And it's incredible how I, I walked away with benefits that felt just like uh, transcendental meditation from that experience. Another angle at this, this waking up is that I think it, it gives you space in this honoring the time to be happy for no reason, because it places this importance on today and now. And so you have to decide how you want to be in today and now. 
And it made me think about time and the periodic cicadas. I wish Austin were here. Uh, these little bugs that are going to come to these trees and make the zzz noises, right? The, those, you're going to hear those probably in a few weeks. They are the 17 year periodic cicadas. This batch of cicadas has been sleeping. They've been in the, the, the nymph stage for 17 years. And when they come to adulthood, they are only going to experience adulthood for a few weeks. Isn't that incredible? And so when they get there, they don't go, man, I got, I got the raw end of the deal. I should have been a butterfly. We got to figure a way out of this. We got to figure out an answer. They're not doing that. They're, what they're doing is they're singing nonstop. You're going to hear them singing nonstop. And so in a way, they're a symbol for us of patience. That's 17 years. But they're also a symbol of the preciousness. 17 years of growing up to be an adult for a few weeks. That's amazing. And so that's, that's a, you know, when you hear those cicadas, think about their journey. There was a, another story that I wanted to share. When I was in my 30s, I was inspired by someone who was fully present and had made the decision to be happy for no reason in that presence. It was someone who uh, was a friend of a girlfriend. She had Crohn's disease and it was severe Crohn's disease. She was in a lot of pain. She had a colostomy bag, but yet she would travel the world with her girlfriends. And they all said she was the most cheerful one in the bunch. And how they felt about complaining about the long flight or complaining about the hotel, it, it really was like a, a spiritual slap in the face to see this girl who decided to be so cheerful and so present. I mean, she had to soak for an hour in the morning in a bathtub full of antibiotic solution and an hour in the evening when they got to the hotel, she had to say, okay, I've got to do this. But when that was done through all the inconvenience and pain, she went on and she never complained about her situation. She decided to be happy. And most of us are more fortunate than this. So we can choose to be happy in our situation. There's so many more examples than this in the world to look to. So I come back to the last dance one more time. And one more lesson that I, that I learned from that movie was don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on yourself. If you remember, that was one of Michael's parents' first lessons that they taught to him. And coincidentally, last night on Facebook, you know, when they share, you, you did this a year ago. I shared a quote exactly a year ago by Travis Alexander that says this, the difference between a stumbling block and a stepping stone is the character of the person walking the path. And I'll say that again, the difference between a stumbling block and a stepping stone is the character of the person walking the path. I'm sure that Don, Barnett has a lot to say about this, this thing called character. But this message to me, I interpreted it this way. Don't give up. And don't give up on one thing in particular. Don't give up on dreaming. You know, people, you hear it all the time. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up on your dreams. But they're dreams that may not be relevant for you anymore. They're dreams that you may want to walk away from. You can like Charles Fillmore says, I reserve the right to change my mind anytime I want. So you can change your mind about your dreams, but don't stop dreaming. Don't stop dreaming. And I realized that part of me needed to hear this message of being present. I needed to hear the story of Michael Jordan because it's hard sometimes when you lose a dream to come back up and stand up and create a new dream but we have to continue to dream and do things that give us passion. So if you fall along the way, like the Buddhists say, fall down seven times, but make sure to get up eight times. And when you lose your motivation, 
call to call to your mind someone who inspires you who inspired you when you were young who gave you hope who picked you up it may be someone that you was in your life or someone that that's a role model from tv it, it doesn't matter where you get this uh, story from but there are people out there that you can emulate as our reading said earlier you can emulate and learn that someone has always overcome so who inspires you today this week for me it was michael jordan who inspired me so my message in wrapping up is never give up always be present live each day as if it were your first day and your last day be happy for no reason and continue to dream for this i am so grateful for these messages that i received i'm so grateful and i hope that you got something out of the talk today and so it is Gratitude before me, gratitude behind me, gratitude to the left of me, gratitude to the right of me, gratitude above me, gratitude below me, gratitude within me, gratitude all around. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful, 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 proud to be for me, proud to be behind me. Gratitude to the left of me, gratitude to the right of me, gratitude above me, gratitude below me, gratitude within me, gratitude all around. I'm so grateful. 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 Gratitude before me. Gratitude behind me. Gratitude to the left of me. Gratitude to the right of me. Gratitude above me, gratitude below me, gratitude within me, gratitude all around. I'm so grateful. 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 Gratitude before me. Gratitude behind me. Gratitude to the left of me. Gratitude to the right of me. Gratitude above me. Gratitude below me. Gratitude within me, gratitude all around. I'm so grateful, so grateful, so grateful, grateful.